So um, I, I guess I just really wanted to reflect back. I wanted to say in terms of the alien belief, um, these sort of um, thoughts and, and feelings that you were reflecting apply to very many beliefs, and, and I was very interested in that. It, it was merely a reflection, actually. Okay, great. Thank yes, you. Thank, thank you. you. Great minister. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, in, in relation to the first point about, yeah, I, people do, uh, I think all of us probably wake up in the morning sometimes just feeling anxious and we're not sure why. Um, when, when I say that uh, explaining, uh, trying to find an explanation for your anxiety is important, um, I don't mean that you should dig on your own around looking for a reason for why you're anxious, because uh, that, in most cases, doesn't help. And I remember doing a podcast about the book, and, and the interviewer was saying to me, um, well, look, I spent ages trying to understand my anxiety, and, and it just made me feel worse. Um, that's not what I mean by an explanation. I mean, uh, I, what I mean is an understanding of the psychological processes by which uh, these feelings come about, which uh, are probably the same for all of us. Those processes are the same. Um, and that's what I think people, I think uh, for me, that was what, what was important for overcoming anxiety. Um, and I think, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that on their own people sit around trying to ruminate about their anxiety at all, because um, that can lead you into areas where it's just going to make it worse if you're not careful. So it was a scientific angle. Um, with regard to screen time, um, you're right. Uh, I, it's not. I don't think screen time is a, is is a big factor. It's how you use the internet, and it's what you use it for. If if you use it for a lot of social media, for example, it, it, uh, and you're an adult or even a kid. Um, if you use it passively and are sitting there watching the perfect lives of everyone else being posted on Instagram and, and, uh, uh, and other social media, for example, um, it's not going to make you feel good um, if you use it in a passive way. So I don't think I, all the evidence I've seen, which I'm, I must admit I'm not an expert on this, but the evidence I've seen suggests that screen time isn't particularly important. It's how you use it. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Graham, Charlie, and Peter, for your presentations. Uh, so I'm Chris, I'm from the uh, UK government, and I was just hoping to ask a question mainly for the, the defence section about what lessons we can learn potentially from the Cold War, um, from the difficulties that uh, defence might experience around not being able to answer some questions directly with classification issues or catering to issues which generally um, are quite controversial by nature and are manipulated by um, our adversaries, that the information space is contested, the views of psychologists are often used against them um, by state media campaign. But, and particularly lessons from the Cold War? This is usually was a question, so I don't know how you really feel. Um, yeah, that's a really hard question. Um, I think there's a lot of good that the problem of anything, any kind of covert or knowledge, is it, it it's always invites speculation. And there, I think there's a re, there's a really good book on the history of the Cold War and conspiracy um, by Timothy Mellie, and he uses this term, the covert sphere, which is and he describes it as a kind of space, as opposed to the public sphere. It's a space for the public to fantasize about what the um, national security state might be doing. Um, so how to stop that fantasy, I, perhaps it is just if there is an epistemological block or something has a, an unusual epistemology where you can't access all the information but you have a certain understanding that something is going on there, um, perhaps that's always impossible to get rid of entirely but I suppose the main things are would be to create an atmosphere of trust if you have to do covert things um, the way that that information is released I think the sort of example of sensory deprivation research which wasn't that seen as very extreme research and it's during its time and it's seen as interesting for a number of reasons um, but because of the covert linkage, it became incredibly sensationalised, and that, that was something that later 
psychologists who worked in the discipline for completely different reasons couldn't couldn't suppress or couldn't so um, I think their problem came with not kind of desensationalizing the earliest experiments, so sort of playing up to the covert image in a way. I hope that that's I don't know if there are any solutions. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Hi, my question is to Graham Davy, but it can be answered by all three. Um, and the question is about what would you imagine this rebranding of psychology as being? And just to give a little bit of background, not too long, um, I'm a Sussex psychology grad, and I loved every single year, it was better and better. And then I graduated and I was like, um, if I go down the academic route, none of my friends or anyone I want to help will be reading the academic papers. Um, and if I go down the clinical route, it's very long and I'm helping only a few people. So I was lost for years and years and years and kept looking at masters. It was only until I discovered coaching psychology and positive psychology as a masters that then it kind of clicked. And I thought the way now psychology is moving with that, it's like a more active and dynamic vehicle of delivering psychology. And what you spoke about, the 75,000 people enrolling, afterwards maybe there's people like me being like, but how can I actively put this where people are going to be searching for it? Yeah, again, um, <clears throat> I, I don't have any answers to that one particularly uh, because I only thought of the idea of rebranding a couple of days ago in the sense that, yeah, you know. Uh, Love it, it has legs. Uh, it, it's, it's a long word, psychology, and uh, it's, a, it's a word that uh, most people have different meanings for, uh, um, and, and that is problematic. And I, I think, you know, uh, psychology needs to promote itself, and, uh, and again, the society has been doing this, it needs to promote itself very broadly, uh, and, and it does try to do that across all of the spheres of, of its potential, the potential help it can provide, and things like that. Um, and, we, and we have to do it, um, because otherwise, um, other pro related professions will simply hijack it. Um, like psychiatry, for example, has hijacked a lot to do with mental health and they're seen now as the body to go to for mental health uh, information and instruction and so on and so forth. And okay, they, 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 have a, um, they do have an important role to play in, in uh, the NHS, for example. So, yeah, uh, they are important. But they do hijack uh, psychology in many ways and... and promote it in their own way as being mental health is a biological thing, not a psychological thing necessarily. Uh, and so I think we need to be aware of that. Um, uh, the coaching thing, I think that's fine. There was, you know, I mean, again, I'm not sure how we, uh, we don't want our subject matter to be hijacked by other groups uh, in, in, in a negative kind of way. But equally, we don't want to tread on the toes of other uh, aspiring groups. So, um, again, I, I, I don't know what the answer is, I'm sure. Um, in a very small way, we've done a bit of rebranding in um, uh, with regard to politics and psychology, and that there has been recently a, a set up a political psychology section of the British Psychological Society, which in itself is a, is a quite a remarkable development in that direction. And one of the interesting things in relation to the point that Graham's made about hijacking is that it, we also have now close relations with the Political Studies Association. And one of the interesting things is that political scientists not, I wouldn't say hijack, but they are using psychological concepts all the time in a way that makes no reference to the extensive literature on those concepts in psychology. So in a sense, establishing that kind of dialogue is really quite important. And I think, in that sense, I think the fact that um, uh, psychology, I would argue, has and can do interesting things to say about politics is, in a sense, quite... Uh, at odds with the kind of notion of psychology as psychologists are the people who deal with people who've got mental disorders, you know. So I think it, it's making this is a much a broader kind of sphere. Mm, great, thank you. Thanks. My name is Sophie. I'm a forensic psychology trainee. Um, thank you, all of you. That was thoroughly um, enjoyable. All of the presentations, and I guess this is a question to all of you. I wondered what you thought about the benefit or the consequence maybe of bringing method into communications with the public as much as content. 
And I wondered if some of the resistance and dismissal that we might get is not so much to the content of what we're saying, but that our rather positivist, empiricist way of looking at things is, is sensed and, and rejected and perhaps feels a bit alienating for some people who might have different implicit theories of, of knowledge. And is there any utility to actually explicitly stating this is what we found, but also this is how we found it and this is why we believe this is a valid way of finding it? Thank you for uh, I mean, I could, I could talk a great deal about method. I have 35 minutes to introduce this friend. I didn't want to get uh, too bogged down there. I mean, certainly I would not accept the positivist, the positivist label. I mean, the, the work I do is empirical, undoubtedly, and there's a great deal of work that we, we do on the detailed analysis of transcripts and videos, which is also interesting because it's something that people can see. Uh, you can point things out and they can see these things and I think that makes it very compelling. So that in a sense I always say that microanalysis has three dimensions. Um, it has the results which I've talked about. It has also embodied a particular theory of communication but it also has practical applications and that's because you can see it so easily and apply these things. Uh, it, people can see it in terms of politicians but they can also apply it in their own daily life. They can reflect on their own communication and in how they could have things done better. So I think there's an awful lot of stuff that is very, very very applicable through this kind of research. But I mean, I'm, I'm, do not, I'm not an experimental psychologist, I don't in a sense set that label, so it's not really, not really what I do. I think the question was more about ontological and epistemological, epistemological position uh, and stating that openly. I don't know if you want to... Well, I, I could, as I say, I mean, I'm stating quite openly. I mean, my, my position is, is not that of a, a positivist. Um, and I. Typically, I don't do experimental research. I, I actually get transcripts, and I analyze, I'm looking at the relationship between different elements. So it's a very different uh, methodology, and also it's a, it's a kind of, in a sense that that um, uh, a lot of what I experimental methods are not really a very appropriate way of, of going about it. Um, you, you can't really do this kind of research experimentation because I, I suppose my interest is more. Do you think that the the way that your work has been received, or the way anybody's work has been received, is to an extent a product of how it was done, as much as what the end product was? I think, in the case, it is because I think, as I say, pe people can can see this and they can hear it and they can see it and can point out things because you can see how it's it's actually so. It is the the uh, the technique of analysis is, is very overt. Um, you, you can actually go, uh, and I think in that sense, a kind of rejection of more traditional approaches to communication, where people use uh, they use very detailed coding systems, which arguably then you you, you it's a sort of pro procustian bed in which you you force all sorts of events in particular categories where they don't really belong. Um, so I think the, the the method is is very open. Okay, thank you. Um, we've perhaps got time for one or two more questions. Have a question there at the back. Uh, yeah, wonderful presentations. Thanks very much. Joe McDonough, Occupational Psychology. In particular, Peter Bull, could you talk very briefly about the three different speech functions you were, you were alluding to there? Arthur Scargo making a speech, um, Margaret Thatcher replying to Jonathan Dimbleby, and then a prime minister responding to a, a leader of the opposition. There are subtly different responses, aren't there? Ways of forming one's response. Because the reason I suppose I ask is I saw James Brokenshire last night uh, with Emily Maitlis, and then various Tories trying to not commit themselves but defend their friend, the Minister for Wales. Um, I'm wondering the final part of my question is is it plus échange? Is it that if you go back and look at, for example, Hansard back 50, 60, 70, 80 years, was it always thus? Or is it the television age we live in that puts politicians on the spot so they kick for the touch? Is that what goes on? Thank you. Um, I think you're asking me an awful lot of questions there, actually. <laughs> I'll try and pick up one or two. Uh, just a very quick observation about Hansard is, of course, not a verbatim record of uh, Parliament. It's, uh, it's, it's organised to make it readable. Um, so it, we, we, don't, we start with Hansard, we think, tend to turned into a blade on which it isn't. Um, I mean, one of the, I think you were alluded to, is a very important point, that context is really important. I've talked about speeches, uh, parliamentary questions, and, and broadcast interviews. They're different contexts, so the way that a, a politician may behave in a broadcast interview is going to be very, very different from the way that they will behave in, in, in parliamentary questions. The fundamental difference being that in a broadcast interview, they're being interviewed by a professional interviewer. In parliamentary questions, it's, a, it's another politician, and typically uh, an, an opposition politician. Um, we're trying to extend historical analysis. I've got a 
colleague in political science in, in, in Scotland, and we, we're hoping to extend our PMQ's analysis through some historical analysis. One obvious question, for example, is if you look at, the, if you look at Cameron, May, and now Johnson, the reply rate is going steadily going down. It's getting worse and worse. Now, what was, if you look at, say, Blair or Brown or even go further, what was the reply rate? We, we need that information. We don't have it. And that's one of the, the historical approaches, one of the things that, that we're going to do, because we want to, one of the things questions people often ask is, is it the case that our, our political discourse is simply deteriorating and they're getting worse and worse? Uh, or are there examples from previous decades which might contradict that? So that's a, a very, I think it's a very important question, and it's one that we are actually hoping to address.